Welcome everyone to the engineering lecture series at the University of Wisconsin Stout. Uh, today we have our speaker, Dr. David Hu, joining us live from Atlanta, where he is a professor at Georgia Tech. And at Georgia Tech, he does work that kind of falls at the intersection of engineering and biology, um, covering some things, uh, various topics, oftentimes topics cover, uh, covered by the, the field of biomimicry. Um, which is the study of how we can learn from animals and nature uh, and hopefully sometimes replicate the things that they accomplish uh, in engineering and in our things that we do. Uh, his work has been featured in national and international venues. Um, it's shown up on uh, in the New York Times, on Saturday Night Live, on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, uh, kind of all over the place. So we're very happy to have Dr. David Hu joining us today. And with that, I will go ahead and turn the presentation over to him. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Devin. It's a pleasure to come talk to you guys virtually. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, some of my favorite animals. At the end of the talk, I'll mention this uh, uh, late night show with Colbert and uh, the square wombat poop that uh, he covered. Uh, last week, I think. So I thought I'd start with the peak of my career. This is um, me at Harvard University um, accepting my Ig Nobel Prize and then accepting my second Ig Nobel Prize, um, which I'll talk about today. The Ig Nobel Prize is for research that makes people laugh and then think. Um, and it's given every year for the last 30 years. Um, but not everyone's always so pleased about this kind of research. Um, there's no sound with this video. I'll just uh, tell you what's going on. But um, this is about four years ago now. Uh, I was on the show Fox and Friends where um, Jeff Flake, uh, he's a senator that every year he highlights uh, 20 of the most wasteful studies in the United States. And my university thought I should make a sort of a public response to this because so you see they put the names of the studies on this wheel and they spin the wheel and uh, see where it lands and they start um, talking about why your study is a waste of money. Um, this is the sort of children's coloring book that he makes uh, called uh, 20 Most Wasteful Studies. And uh, like I said, my university thought I should respond because um, out of these 20 studies, I was responsible for about three of them. So that's like 15% in the entire country. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 50 cents pretty good. Uh, um, how many shakes does it take for a wet dog to dry off? We'll talk about that uh, in this talk. Um, which has more hairs, a squirrel or a, hum a bumblebee? Um, uh, that's about a million um, if you can, we calculated it. And uh, it's part of uh, trying to understand how animals get clean and how part, many parts of their body can get dirty. And how long does it pee like a racehorse? So if you stick around, you'll get to see all these, uh, all these studies. So I wrote a response in um, Confessions of Wasteful Scientists that talks about how in research you really can't tell which is going to be uh, good or bad. Um, you just have to sort of follow the interesting questions. That's what I've done. So uh, my work uh, as a scientist, so my parents are actually chemists. Um, this is me um, back in Chicago uh, where I was born. Um, and they've always told me to sort of follow my interest and uh, wherever my curiosity leads. Uh, but it wasn't until sort of many years later um, when I was uh, mistakenly admitted to MIT uh, in college um, where I sort of learned the tools that I would eventually use to understand how these animals do these amazing things. Um, so I stayed there until my PhD. This is me. I'm so happy I did a somersault at my PhD ceremony. Um, and over those eight years, I picked up so I studied mechanical engineering and mathematics. I think most of you are mechanical engineers. Um, and I use those to understand um, how certain things in nature work. So the first uh, study I, I did in my career was this study on um, how insects walk on water. So this video I like to call two um, parents having a discussion. Um, it's these water shredders that are literally like just not just walking and running, but jumping, summer tossing, um, wrestling on the water surface, all like it's on dry land. So they do all this without breaking the surface. And this happens by virtue of the 
uh, hairs they have on their legs. So they've got a 10,000 hairs per square millimeter. It's one of the hairiest surfaces in the world. Um, and then what that does, it presents a really rough surface to water. And the surface tension of water once prevents it from really getting to the nooks and crannies of the hairs um, because it's so rough. Uh, so as a result, the entire surface is what we call hydrophobic or non-wetting. And uh, water striders can stand on here with only a small percentage of their body actually getting wet. So at the time, so this is uh, us actually taking a video of me back in the lab, back in graduate school, um, late at night. And uh, these are one of the photos that we took. At the time, there's this big controversy in how these insects could actually propel themselves on the water surface. Um, it was understood that they stood by virtue of surface tension. You know, if you add little drops of, of um, soap, they just immediately sink. But how they actually push themselves forward was a mystery. And so we showed that they actually, even though their legs are really, really thin, they're the thickness of a human hair, they can generate these vortices, just like with a rowboat's oar. And they do that by pushing down the water surface and generating these divots, these um, sort of sort of pockets in the, in the water that they actually use to push back uh, more water. Um, this is a photo we call Icarus because uh, the insect tries to go close to this sort of um, dye, this, uh, this pH sensitive dye that also reduces surface tension. But if it gets too close, um, it gets too ambitious, it'll just fall through. And I was super happy about um, uh, when I came to Georgia Tech because my first day of teaching fluid mechanics there, there was actually the cover of the fluid mechanics textbook. Some of you may use this, Monsignor Kishi. It's a great book. Um, had the photo for my research. So uh, some of you might wonder, hey, what's in this for me? What what about these insects um, can actually teach us about how you know large things can walk in water like us? Um, well, for that, you've got to look at larger animals. So this is the um, what in Brazil they call the Jesus Christ lizard, the basilisk lizard. And uh, this is it uh, running on water in high-speed video, and this is it in real time. Um, hold on a second. In real time, it just is a flash. Um, these lizards are about, you know, the size of your hand. Um, here we go. Yeah, that's what it looks like in real time. So how does it happen? Well, uh, Tanya Shen and some other investigators, they high-speed film these, in, these uh, water runners going over the water surface. And um, there's sort of three things happening. One, they accelerate their foot as it hits the water. That generates this large force, same force that a diver feels when a diver uh, uh, dives into water. Um, then they keep on pushing uh, the hydrostatic pressure on the bottom of the foot and sort of the inertia of that foot uh, still support the lizard's weight. And right before they pull the foot out of the water, the cavity, uh, the cavity stays open. So they pull out the foot so quickly that the cavity collapses actually after the foot's gone. So that reduces drag. And by doing all these three things, um, they can support their weight. Um, so Devin might assign this as a homework assignment or a quiz. I'm just kidding. He probably won't do that. But if you wanted to leave this talk um, knowing how animals walk in water, there's two ways you should remember. One, you can use surface tension like these insects that walk in water. Um, uh, then you need like basically the problem is insect, you know, water starter only weighs as much as a paperclip. Uh, we wear like 100,000 times more. So you need a foot about the, with a perimeter of a 10 kilometers, which is just really too big to be useful. The other option is you can slap your feet really quickly on the water surface. Um, and the good news is that you can run 30 meters per second. Um, and if you could move your feet that fast through water, you could literally walk on water if you had feet the size of about a square meter. But the problem is we can run through air that quickly, but when you actually push water, you need a thousand times more. Um, you have, the, the density is a thousand times more, so you need 15 times more power before um, you can actually uh, support your weight. So still not possible, maybe with exoskeleton. So this is the this is the uh, first study we did on um, a sort of animals and how they move in these amazing ways. And um, one of the thing, things we did, this was my graduate school roommate, Brian Chen. He built this device that we called RoboStrider, um, which is basically a really a loose, lightweight aluminum body with stainless steel legs and this spring that allowed it to row on water without breaking the surface. So we called this a dry rowboat because it could go and without like pushing the skin of a pudding, it was able to move on the water surface. 
there's it with its natural counterpart. And throughout this talk, I'll sort of mention ways that when possible, we can come up with um, devices that actually um, do as well as the real thing. So fast forward um, a couple years later, this is um, also a problem that involves fluid mechanics, um, but you might not think so when you first see it. It's um, how cats clean themselves. Um, and um, so in nature, what we usually do is we find some model organism, some champion that's really good at, at, at doing a certain task. And for cats, they're one of the, seem like the cleanest animals out there. Um, they actually spend six hours a day grooming themselves. You can see all these different cats. Um, you know, they're all over the world, 30 species of various sizes from your house cat all the way to this cheetah. And uh, my grad student, Alexis, um, and I, we really under, want to understand how they can groom themselves so well. Um, uh, one of the first things we did was we um, got some cat tongues um, from, uh, we, we went to this place called Tennessee Tiger Haven, and we can you can calculate based on how much a tongue holds of saliva that a cat only uses about three tablespoons a day to clean itself. So that's only three tablespoons of saliva per day, whereas your when you take a shower, it takes 10 liters um, or more. So how can they get clean with just three tablespoons, and why does it take us 10 liters? Well, the first thing is um, cats groom themselves very quickly. So this is uh, every single second of a cat grooming, you can see the tongue going across the body. So their tongues, if you've ever been licked by a cat, doesn't feel the same as if you're licked by a person. It's very, very rough. Uh, it's almost like sandpaper. Um, and that's because the tongue has about 180 um, small spines on it um, that capture saliva and allow it to spread all over the surface of the fur. Um, so if you actually calculate the surface area of a cat, including the surface area of all those hairs, um, you get about two square meters. That's about the same size as a ping pong table. Um, so it's a huge amount of area that this cat has to cover in order to clean itself. Here you can see the spies, spines again sort of being ejected, being like opened up, uh, the tongue expanding in all these different directions. Um, and this allows them to really get into the nooks and crannies in the fur, um, which is two square meters. It's a huge area to cover. Now, this is the part I really love about uh, biology. Um, you know, as an engineer, um, you, you basically get this huge library of sort of ways you can solve the mystery. Um, so we went over to Tennessee Tiger Haven, this place that um, it's where kind of like illegally bought cats in the U.S. go to retire um, so you can get uh, these are actually their tongues. Um, uh, cats, bobcats, cougars, snow leopards, tigers, and lions. And that tongue is as tall as your head. Um, and don't worry, these, cat, these cats were already all dead when we got to them. Uh, we just uh, ransacked their freezer. And one of the things you notice is that they all maintain the same pattern of basically sort of a soft tongue, um, gets larger with body size, and a uh, series of spikes, and it's about 280, and that's the same number of spikes from a cat all the way up to lion. Um, this is what one of these uh, spikes looks like. So technically, they're called papillae, um, filiform papillae. These um, sort of keratinous, kind of similar to your fingernails that stick out of the tongue. Um, this is a 3D scan and a 3D print um, of a tiger's uh, spine, tongue, tongue spine. And uh, I was curious, so we were kind of surprised to see that it actually had this long sort of skateboarding ramp groove in the middle. Um, it's kind of see, strange to see such structures. And uh, when I saw this, it kind of reminded me of um, some of the fluid mechanics papers I read about how hum hummingbirds drink. Um, but if you take, uh, for example, a towel or you take a really thin capillary tube and you just touch it to the surface of water, if that surface is hydrophilic, uh, water will just immediately Im get imbibed up into the surface. So just like a wet towel, a towel gets hung into a bath of water, it's going to eventually become wet. Um, uh, water is going to rise against gravity to sort of just evenly coat the surface and reduce its surface energy. And for a cat, this happens every time the animal puts its tongue in its mouth. It basically fills each of these 208 papillae with um, fluid, saliva, and it can use that to coat its hairs. So that's part one of how the tongues can get uh, the saliva. And the saliva is a, basically a detergent. It's a surfactant. It's used to coat each of the individual hairs. 
And the great thing about the, each of these papillae is that the width of them is, is exactly proportioned to about two or three hairs. So these papillae are really, really um, filled with this detergent, the saliva, and every time it grooms, it doesn't waste any because it only gets removed every time the surface of the tongue touches an individual hair. So um, you can see here a single hair getting coated with just an evenly co even coat of the saliva and over 20 grooms, you can see this cat with a um, thermal image, over 20 grooms, the cat will be able to evenly coat it's kind of a wash, rinse, and then dry cycle to basically, you know, dissolve contaminants and then suck them up back up. And it's so good at this that actually parts of the body, um, it has lost all its sweat glands. So the cats, the only way they can actually dry themselves is by um, putting saliva deep into their fur and letting that evaporate. So it has now served two purposes. So... We saw that this cat is really, really good at getting saliva deep into the fur. Um, but we also noticed that its tongue is very different from modern hairbrushes, and not even just modern, but ancient hairbrushes. In fact, they're pretty much the same. This is a comb from 8000 BC um, made out of bone. But all hairbrushes have these properties that they've got sort of vertical spikes and a very rigid base. Um, and you see the cat tongue is totally different. You've got the cat tongue has these spikes sort of all facing forward, um, and the base is very, very soft. Um, so we actually, we patented this, and we're trying to find um, trying to find a company that is going to sell the first 10,000 brushes. Um, they've also got this really nice property that, for example, a normal hairbrush, because the spines are vertical and each of, and the base is rigid, it's very difficult to clean. Um, you basically have to sit there, maybe on a Friday night with some ice cream and you know pull these hairs out individually one by one. Um, but the issue is, is that cats, if cats had to do this, they would immediately, they would have a lot of problems. They, they'd suffocate and things like that. So because the spines are all facing one direction, you know, in the, when they're, when they're not being used, the cat can sort of roll the tongue on the roof of its mouth and then basically they can get a hairball. And they can get this at any time of day, like 2 a.m., 4 a.m. Anytime it wants to puke in your slippers and make your make your um, life a mess, it can get out that hairball. So it's on demand. So I know there's some dog lovers in the audience, so I had to talk about some of our research on uh, how dogs clean themselves. Um, this is also featured in my book, um, uh, How to Walk Water to Climb Up Walls. So this video I'm showing you, this is about um, these shakes occur about four times a second, um, so you can ba barely see one with the naked eye. And if you blink, you're gonna you're gonna miss it. Um, the wet dog shake is pretty interesting because the dogs, if you actually calculate, they exert thirty to uh, thirty to fifty times Earth's gravity with a shake, um, and that's what's needed to sort of remove all these water droplets. Um, we've weighed dogs. If you weigh yourself coming out of a bath, you get a pound extra uh, of water on the as a very thin layer across your skin. Dogs get um, they can weigh um, a couple pound uh, another also a pound. Um, so you can have a pound of water in its fur. And if we were to evaporate that water just with body heat, the dogs would actually use about a third of its daily calories. So it's very expensive if they were to basically just heat this off. So with evolution of fur, also had to come with evolution of way to immediately remove this water. And for them, it just takes about two or three seconds, whereas our laundry machines take, um, you know, minutes to get something that dry. So just like with the cat study, I'll show you some. These are some videos of different animals uh, shaking. Um, this is a mouse. It's about um, so the dog was four times a second. This mouse is actually thirty times a second. It's really really fast. Um, so in a single eye blink, you'll miss ten of these shakes. Um, I mentioned it's about uh, 20 to 50 Gs. Um, so, for example, this rat, um, in order to prevent its eyeballs from popping out, it's got to sort of keep its eyes shut and closely uh, keep them keep them um, cl uh, from popping out. Colonel John Stapp, he's this um, sort of uh, Air Force Air Force pilot. He actually went on a rocket sled and slammed on the brakes, and he showed that you know when you get in a car accident, the parts that you get hurt the most are your sort of um, soft organs like your eyes and things like that. Here's one of the largest animals shaking, showing that, you know, this method of removing waters works for both small animals all the way up to large ones. 
Um, here it's so big that it can't even keep its eyes shut. It's really, it's really um, the force, its centripetal forces on these eyes are really, really big. So the wet dog shake has two secrets, um, and the first gets down to sort of a long-standing mystery among uh, on for mammals is why do mammals have such loose skin? Um, if you can pick up a dog by the sort of scruff of its neck or a rabbit, um, and part of that reason is to remove water. So you can see this This is a video my student Andrew Dickerson took. He's now a professor at Tennessee. Um, that straw is actually the top of the dog's back. So that means that I can put something on the top of my back and it's going to whip 90 degrees to the left and 90 degrees to the right. Um, that's a really, really large displacement. Um, for example, if you take the same uh, experiment you do with rats, here you we've x-rayed rats doing the wet dog shake. Um, the backbone really only goes back and forth uh, 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Um, so just by having loose skin, animals can basically triple the amplitude of the motion of the fur. That multiplies the force, which goes the um, uh, amplitude squared, um, by a factor of nine, so they can get basically ten, almost ten times the force just by having loose skin than if they had sort of tight skin. So um, my lab, we don't just do vertebrates. Um, we also do a lot of work on invertebrates, which some of you might find kind of creepy. Um, but Frankly, the invertebrates have been around a really long time. They've do, done some miraculous things um, that vertebrates will never be able to do because we just haven't had enough time to evolve. Um, so you guys are in Wisconsin. It's a little cold um, for fire ants, but if you're basically anywhere below the half southern half of the United States, um, our entire country is invaded with these uh, ants from Brazil. Um, and this is them actually, this is ants being pushed out of a funnel, um, ants forming a raft, which I'll show lots of videos of, uh, ants escaping my lab by sort of building this bivouac, sort of this uh, siege tower to escape containers, um, an ant holding on to 50 of its neighbors just by one, one leg. So the fire ants are pretty amazing because they um, evolved in a place that, that was a uh, flooded um, uh, every year. So during the wet season, the Pantanal of Brazil, this is a sort of vast wetland, um, gets covered with water. And the only way the ants could survive was to uh, link themselves together and build these waterproof rafts. So this is actually what you see here. Um, we've dripped ants. That means we sort of simulate rain and drop water on their homes. And we come back the next day and the soil's on the bottom and all the ants have flowed to the top. <laughs> Um, we've CT scanned their bodies once they've been in these uh, rafts um, and fla flash frozen them. And we can see that their bodies are can be covered in basically attachment points with each other. So each of the footprints of the ants has little drops of fluid. That's how they climb ceilings and walls um, that they can use to attach anywhere on the body. And this gets back down to the water strider talk we talked about in the beginning. Um, they, they basically simulate the water stirred leg or Gore-Tex um, by making a surface that's really rough, um, but that has lots of holes. And for example, all this clear transparent area you see, that's all air pocket. So every time you try to sink them, um, water has real difficulty in getting into these little spaces and the entire draft still remains dry. And that's an issue if you actually want to get rid of them because they're just sort of so, so good at surviving these floods. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is a film of us um, making ants into ant snowballs. That's the best we have for snow down here. Um, and we can use these to simulate basically uh, how they build rafts and how quickly um, uh, those rafts will expand. So that's, yeah, that's um, about 10,000 ants right there. And if you put those ants on the water surface, this is the kind of thing you'll see. Um, over about three minutes, whatever shape you start with, eventually the ants will rebuild into what they think is the best shape for the water surface. And for them, there's always two layers. There's the um, undergraduates on the bottom that are sort of getting wet, trampled, um, drowning. And then there's the professors on top that really don't have any problems. They're just standing on top of undergrads and uh, using them as a living raft. Um, 
Uh, and this, well, I was just kidding. They're not actually drowning. They um they actually bring air bubbles with them all the time, so that it allows them to actually literally breathe through artificial gills that the air bubbles present. Uh, air diffuses into these things, so they can live on this thing for weeks on end if they have to. These rafts are pretty amazing. We're, we actually have a, still have an army research grant to study them now. Um, if the raft hits another rock, um, it will bounce off it because the ants themselves have, can store elastic energy. It's got a spring constant comparable to um, Young's modulus of salad greens. If you ever eat salad, you can think about that. Um, or if you drink yogurt, um, you drop a penny through the raft. Um, this penny will actually fall through the raft because it has a viscosity. The pen, the ants have a viscosity of um, yogurt. Um, so you can see these two elements um, together. It means that you know small objects and big objects. It's really hard to do them harm. Here's another video for your nightmares. Um, if you ever like string cheese or pizza, imagine um, pulling pizza apart. Uh, and this is what happens if you try to pull the ant raft apart. The ants, they're really, really tightly held. Um, in fact, during war times, they'll actually use their bodies to rip each other apart. But um, when they're holding on to their neighbors, they know to sort of release, but try to hold on just till the last minute in case that the forces go away. And don't worry, you know, these ants are falling like, you know, 10 body heights. None of them are getting injured because when you're that small, the terminal velocities are really, really low. So I could toss them off a building and they'll be just fine. So these days, uh, a lot of roboticists are being inspired by the ant research we've done. This is um, uh, one study done by at UPenn of these small uh, floating uh, boats that have similar um, principles as the ants, where they basically um, link onto each other and they can build larger, more capable robots. A couple years ago, the grand challenges of robotics was to build modular robots, things that can grip themselves together just like the ants can. And those you can imagine those being deployed in you know inhospitable environments, places where you don't know what you're going to come across, but you got to bring a lot of parts. Okay, we're almost wrapping up. We've got two more. Um, I've got two more stories to tell you. Um, these are my two Ig Nobel prizes, um, the research that I'm sort of most known for. Um, this first one started. So this is. I believe that. All researchers have got to do something fun in addition to what they're um, doing. Because there's a lot of questions out there. And um, this is a question that arose when I was, um, my kids are older now, but uh, at the time I was changing a lot of diapers. And um, I came across this question of how long does it take animals to pee? Um, because I was noticing little kids really pee for a really long time. Um, and uh, I, I posed this as a challenge to my undergraduates in my fluid mechanics class. Um, I, I asked if there anyone want to go to the land zoo with me and film animals peeing. And uh, I got uh, two volunteers, and this is our um, school photographer. Um, they I love this project so much. This one wearing the boxer shorts there, um, he actually uh, he actually became a professional urologist. So he just never left the world of urine. He just loves it. Um, he's going to give me a free exam, I'm, I'm telling him, in a few years. Um, and I asked him to go to the Atlanta zoo and tell me what animal – peas for the longest and how much pee do they make um and i expect it to be the biggest animal um but here's here's the answer to that question so this is the world of urination so all these animals got to reject eject this fluid waste but how do they do it now if you're a mouse or a rat the difficulty is that your surface tension is higher than your bladder pressure so the surface tension forces holding the urine in cause you can't even make a jet. You just make little urine drops and it just you know comes out of your body like little gumballs. Before this talk, or maybe you might even listen to this talk in the bathroom, who knows, because we're on Teams. Um, you probably saw this, um, this urine stream similar to a goat where you have a jet turning in drops eventually. Wisconsin, you guys have these. Cows, I know you guys have these. That's what you're known for. They will generate this fluid sheet. Yeah, uh, that that will eventually break up. You don't have these in Wisconsin. All right, this is part one of the study and part two all in the same video. I mean, I was so happy about this research because it was like, I considered it super um, high efficiency because we were able to publish part one and part two of my student's PhD thesis all in the same video. I was really happy. I just got to show this again because it really shows you, you know, nothing is really solid. Um, everything is that's what the um greeks said 
in rheology. They said nothing, everything flows even 10 kilograms of elephant dung as it hits the ground. There we go. Okay, so the students came back with this, these videos and this data, um, and they showed me this chart. This is the time it takes to urinate versus their body mass. And so the great thing about nature is, I don't know if you've ever seen an elephant close up, but they're really big. Um, they're 8,000 kilograms. That's the weight of like, a, that's like basically 8,000 kilograms. It's like two or three cars. Um, and they pee for an average of about 22 seconds. Um, uh, and in fact, all these animals, their average urination time is about 21 seconds, uh, plus or minus 13 seconds. So there's a factor, there's a small, there's an error factor. Um, but you got to keep in mind the bladders of these animals. You know, an elephant's bladder is uh, 20 liters. It's the size of a kitchen garbage can. Uh, and it's 100 times that of a dog, which is, you know, about this big. So a factor of 100, but then you get the urination time to be uh, within the factor two is pretty amazing. So how does this work? Um, well, if you took undergraduate fluid mechanics um, and you've been to some fraternity parties, which I know you have, um, you might be familiar with uh, Pascal's barrel um, or beer keg physics. And the question is, if you are at one of your parties and you want to get beer out the fastest, where do you poke the hole? Um, and I, you want to poke it at the bottom. And that's what Pascal showed. He said, basically, if I had this barrel and I want to basically explode it, what do I do? And what he did to entertain people, um, the legend has it, is that he put this 10 meter tall pipe and he just filled that pipe. You know, the pipe could just be an inch in diameter. So really small amount of fluid compared to the rest of the rest of the barrel. But if he did that, he could make this barrel explode. So what that tells you is that it doesn't matter how much fluid you have. It just matters its distribution in space. That if I take a fluid and I stack it vertically, I can get an arbitrarily high pressure. Um, and that's exactly what the animals are doing. Um, they have this really thin uh, PP pipe, um, uh, urethra, and they stack it. Um, for example, this is uh, these three containers of rhino, human, and dog urine, uh, and three pipes. You might be able to barely see them um, on the left. With the three pipes of the appropriate diameter and length of the animals, I can get these vessels to all empty at the same time. Um, do you see my cursor, by the way, when I go like this? Oh, no. Okay, don't worry about it. Um, and don't worry. It's just yellow water. It's not real urine. But you, you'll you never really know, will you? Okay, so that was my first Ig Nobel Prize. Um, if you watch uh, Stephen Colbert last week, he brought up this cuboidal feces, um, which kind of was a follow-up. I think someone – I was at a fluid mechanics conference. Someone dared me to study this because um, we, published, we published an article on – the time it takes to defecate, which is about 12 seconds. Um, and they said, hey, your model doesn't encapsulate cuboidal feces, which we read about in Ranger Rick magazine. I was like, oh, does it? So we found this Australian collaborator who sent us these nice dice in the mail. And by dice, I mean cubic wombat feces. So uh, that's a 3D scan of one of these pieces of feces. So Scott Carver, he's a great guy. Um, for his job, he actually goes and captures wombats, which are about the size of a toddler that would run super fast. Um, oh, man, he just couldn't get that one. Oh, just almost made it. Um, they run super fast. Um, they are super cute. I don't think I can actually beat them in terms of how cute they are. They're number two world's cutest creature. Um, body of an obese toddler, face of a teddy bear, nose of a koala. And they spend their entire day eating grass. Um, so they produce one of the driest feces out there. Um, oh, sorry. They produce one of the driest feces out there, and they even have these weird evolution adaptations that – so they're marsupials. Um, and they're they're actually – they have these little um, pockets where they put their young, like all marsupials, and those pockets actually have to face behind so they don't get dirt in them when they dig. And unfortunately, that means that's where their butt is. So that means they're always pooping on their babies. So you think you have a rough, wait until you're a wombat baby. Now, you know, 10,000 species of mammals, why in the world do we only have, uh, so not 10,000, it's only like a couple thousand, like two or 5,000 species of mammals. But why do we only have one that makes cuboidal feces? Well, it has to do with, just like the ants, they evolve in this special area. 
these wombats are involved in a very drought prone area. So their feces was by nature very dry. And um, they're also very territorial. Um, so they live in these underground burrows most of the time. And they live in these territories that they guard and mark them. They mark them with latrines, these sort of places that the tallest that they can climb, you know, little squat bodies can climb, which is usually a rock or a stump. And they'll defecate on top of this thing as a flag uh, and telling other uh, other wombats, other animals, hey, wombats are here, stay out. Now, what I think what happened is when Wombat Case Zero first did this, a cylinder hit the rock and it just rolled to the bottom. And that wombat said, oh. And then natural selection, generations, generations later, they evolved these flat sides and edges so that when they laid poop on the rock, it would stay there as a marker. So the Australians, if you go over there and talk about wombats, they'd be like, yeah, wombats, they basically have these square buttholes. Um, just like spaghetti comes out of a dye, you have a dye that sets the shape of the um, poop. So this is a CT scan of a wombat butt. You can see its fat little legs, and uh, its anus is pretty circular. So it's not about the butthole. Oh, am I allowed to say that? Oh, you guys are college students. You can deal with it. Okay. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, <laughs> I should have warned you. This is going to be a gross picture. So the wombats are all found from, they're actually roadkill, unfortunately, in Australia. Really big roadkill. And uh, that's a poor wombat. Um, and these are his intestines. So Scott Carver, he sent us the wombat intestines in the mail, which is one of the best Christmas presents I've ever gotten. Um, and near its stomach, you see it's basically like you expect, kind of like, yellow slurry kind of mixed up grass and digestive juices mostly liquid but then amazingly as you cut those intestines open and you go to the very end it becomes really really you know cubic you know these flat edges and sides and it means the cubes actually formed inside the body so a couple things first these intestines are really long they're like 10 meters long um they're the same length as the human intestines you know you could if you eviscerated yourself you could put your intestines around the room 30 feet but a wombat only weighs a third as much as a human but they've got just as long intestines um so the first thing is what sets the spacing between the intestines um well that's set by this is a paper we're writing up right now about the rate of drying so when material dries or cools it shrinks and that will cause stress and if that process is done slowly enough you can get really uniform stress and you can get even cracks if you go to Great Giant Causeway Ireland or there's a place in Yellowstone that has these hexagonal, they're called hexagonal um, columnar jointings, you can see hexagons uh, forming on rock and in cord and starch of all constant spacing. And we think it's the slow process. Wombats keep their poop for about three to five days or more like one to two days. Um, if you had a bad lunch, maybe just a few hours. But in general, they keep them a lot drier than we do. Now, what about the other four sides? OK, so we hung wombat intestines uh, from the ceiling. Uh, that's what my lab looks like. Yep, kind of gross. And uh, we noticed one thing is that all the edges of the corners aligned. And that means the wombat intestines have a plan. They kind of know where the corners are going to be. And as they do their 40,000 oscillations, peristalsis, um, their plan uh, realizes itself by forming the corners all in the same place. But of course, intestines, they can't tell the poop what to do, so it has to tell it in terms of properties. And uh, when we actually measure the poop, OK, so this is actually, that's not a wombat. That's another animal, a rat. Um, when we actually measure, we take the intestine, and sort of snip it off, and pull it apart, and we actually do a stress strain test on this thing. We find they're not like human intestines, which are sort of circular and even material properties, so equally stretching all around. A wombat intestine calamari would basically be really stiff in two places and really um, soft in two other places. So in two places, it'd be really chewy. Um, and what that does over 40,000 cycles, the, the really stiff parts, as they contract, they form corners first, and that's what sets two of the corners. You can imagine, basically, if you've got a really high stiffness, that's going to contract first, and that'll give you sort of a high radius of curvature. And the other two corners fall in the soft regions that are sort of left behind because the other regions are contracting first. It's subtle, but over 40,000 cycles, you're going to get a process like this that turns a perfect circle into one with a square. Okay, 
I've subjected you to enough uh, disturbing videos. Um, if you like being disturbed, um, so I was last week. I was at Princeton. Um, I'll be in the North Carolina Academy of Sciences in March. Then Rochester Institute of Technology, Harvard Colloquium, Genentech, and then uh, APS Living Histories has a series of us talking about our life as scientists. If you like this story, um, uh, you can think about my book, How to Walk on Water and Climb Up Walls, on Amazon, translating to lots of languages. And if you want to reach out to me, you can email me or uh, send me a Twitter at Dr. David Hu.